Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are around the globe. Welcome to our panel discussion today uh, on the topic of the domestic energy transition in resource rich countries, the role of gas and renewables. This webinar is organized by NRGI, the Natural Resource Institute, and ETH Nadel, the Center for Development and Cooperation. Today's panel discussion is uh, the public closing event of the 2023 edition of the Advanced Course on Natural Resource Governance and the Energy Transition, where we discuss policies and practice. And we do that together, Energy IE and ETH Nadel, for a couple of years now already. And in this year's edition, we had uh, 42 participants from 21 different countries from Latin America, Africa, Central Asia, East Asia. So a very diverse group and a very fascinating and active and engaged group. Uh, and just before we start with the panel, let me just congratulate uh, you all for finishing and completing this course. You are a fantastic cohort. Uh, you have not just finished uh, the course now, but you have now, or you become now, kind of alumni of the uh, advanced course natural resources and governments training. And the uh, alumni, they meet or exchange and continue to be involved. And uh, so we look forward to continued involvement and exchange with you. Uh, just to let you know, we have, uh, for example, an alumni event this week on Wednesday in Zambia uh, at the end of uh, IGF. Uh, conference on taxation in, in uh, extractive industries. So we will keep you updated in, involved uh, and look forward also to learn from your experience as you apply what you have learned. With that, uh, let's focus now on the topic of today's uh, debate, the domestic energy transition in resource rich countries, which is again different than the energy transition uh, that is typically discussed in the global north countries and the global south is kind of uh, where many countries have actually assets that are probably stranded, but also have significant energy poverty in the, in the sense that large shares of the populations do not have access to uh, yeah, what's called usually modern electricity or modern energy sources. Uh, but this is our, these are all topics that the panel will discuss now, and I'm uh, very glad to invite uh, Lori Haitayan. She's the regional director for the Middle East and North Africa at NRGI, knows the topic inside out, and I'm very glad that uh, you, uh, Lori, uh, accepted to moderate today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fritz, uh, for inviting me and uh, to, to moderate. It's my pleasure. So uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all, wherever uh, you are. It's my pleasure today to moderate the session to discuss the role of gas and renewables in domestic energy uh, transitions. Uh, this morning, I was moderating a session in Arabic on the role of the MENA resource-rich countries in advancing or not the energy transition agendas. And we talked about challenges and opportunities, uh, but uh, it was really uh, interesting when I asked the Iraqi uh, expert on what his country is doing about energy transition, he talked to me about investing in renew in gas, in gas project and how gas is important for his country. So it was interesting to see that for them, they understand energy transition where gas plays an important role, where the other, uh, where the other expert in the, in the webinar had a different understanding of it. So it made me feel that, wow, okay, so this is the Middle East. And now in the afternoon, I'm going to moderate uh, another session that covers three other continents, Latin America, uh, Europe, and Africa. And, and I'm really uh, excited to hear uh, if they have the same uh, approach or the same objectives or the, the same challenges like the MENA uh, is having. So uh, I'm really uh, happy to moderate the session. And I'm, ha I'm really happy not only to be moderating like uh, uh, and, and, and hearing uh, uh, our experts from 
three different continents, but also happy to moderate all women panel. So congratulations to the EPAH and congratulations to NRGI uh, to uh, make that uh, uh, happen. So uh, with us today to discuss about the role of gas and renewable in energy transitions, in different energy transitions in different countries, I am happy uh, to uh, uh, host today uh, three uh, experts, uh, uh, Ms. Yaye Katrin Diop, uh, she's uh, our first guest. She's an energy uh, engineer, graduated from RMIT in Paris. Currently, she's an energy expert at the Permanent Secretariat of Energy in Senegal, uh, which principal roles are to define the dashboard of the energy sector investment plan, uh, control the implementation of the projects, coordinate the monitoring uh, of the performance contracts. At the ministry, she's actively associated to the discussions on sustainable development and energy transition strategies, the course in Senegal. And she took part to important events related, related to the energy world, such as COP27, G20, uh, Energy Transition Working Group. And we heard that she was involved in the JETP as well in for Senegal. And we'll be hearing the uh, updates on that since the announcement has been made uh, yesterday or the day uh, before. Also with us, uh, we have uh, from Italy, we have Dr. Giulia Giordana, and she's an Italian researcher and practitioner with extensive experience in the Middle East. She joined the creation of ECHO at its uh, early stages of conception and now leading ECHO's international programs. And ECHO is a climate uh, change think tank, and I understood the first independent Italian climate, uh, uh, climate uh, change think tank founded in 20. Uh, 21, and its mission is to accelerate climate uh, action. Uh, uh, Dr. G uh, Giordano has a PhD in cooperation for peace and development from the University of uh, Stran the University Stranieri of Perugia, uh, and her interests include environmental diplomacy, transboundary, water cooperation, uh, and Middle Eastern uh, uh, politics, uh, and others. Thank you, uh, Dr. Julia, for accepting to be with us as well. Happy to have you. And we do have from Latin America, we have Maruzia Ruiz Caro. So welcome, uh, Maruzia. Uh, she's an economist from uh, Humboldt University of Berlin. I, I, am, I hope I'm pronouncing all the names right. Uh, she has completed an analysis for NRGI actually on the gas situation in Colombia and Peru and the direction both countries are taking regarding the future of gas and relationship with the energy transition. She has extensive experience in the study of hydrocarbon policies in Peru, especially regarding gas, as well as the transparency of the extractive uh, sector. And she has worked as an advisor to the Senate Hydrocarbons uh, Commission. So uh, welcome as well. And uh, Maruzia will be covering uh, Colombia this time, but of course, uh, uh, Peru, she has experience in Peru as well. So uh, welcome uh, all. Uh, what we'll do is like we'll have a discussion first uh, with our experts, and then we'll move on to uh, the Q&A section where we will take your questions and uh, we will ask them to the uh, experts. So please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, section. So let me first start. I have, an, if you want a common question to you all, just like, to get started with the uh, discussion. So, and I start with uh, Yaya Katrin, and it's about like a year, of, a, a year and a half into the Russia-Ukraine war that created a global energy crisis and brought to the forefront the issue of energy security. So it became an important uh, issue. In your views, and this is for Yaya Katrin and then for Julia and Marutia, in your views, did the energy crisis help ac accelerate the energy transition in the countries, in your countries of focus, or on the contrary, it slowed down the process. So Yaya Katrin, let's hear uh, from you. What are your views on that? Please unmute yourself. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I was already presented by, by, um, by the colleagues. So I will go uh, immediately to the, to the question. So since the beginning of the Russian Ukraine war uh, in Senegal, we witnessed uh, several impacts on our economy. 
the, the main ones are in food and energy insecurity. Uh, we witnessed an increase in energy prices, uh, as well as supply disruptions that conducted, for example, to electrical load shedding. Uh, I, I should say that Senegal had elaborated a plan uh, to move towards energy transition. And as I will demonstrate later, uh, we want to use our discovered natural resources uh, especially gas to help in the energy transition from heavy fuels that represent 100% of our thermal production uh, today. But since the beginning of the war, we saw that increasing inflationary pressures uh, has increased our debt vulnerability in this sector. So the war in, in Ukraine has made the financial markets very difficult and slowed it down the financing of our local gas project development. Uh, and we continue to, obs to observe this struggle um, and we have to respond to these challenges. So as I said, uh, and I will demonstrate later, gas is part of our energy transition. And today we are seeing that the financing of this kind of projects are very compromised uh, since, uh, um, since the, 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 the beginning of this war. So the, my answer to this question will be yes. Uh, this war uh, slowed it down the process uh, of our energy, energy transition in Senegal. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for, the, for your answer. Uh, we move on now to uh, Julia and uh, to look uh, from your perspective and your focus, how did this Ukraine-Russia war impacted the energy transition? Did it slow down or on the contrary, it accelerated it? Yes, so first of all, thank you so much, Laurie, for inviting me and thank you to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me to this discussion. And uh, I, I also echo your, your, you know, your remark about being on an all-women panel, which is really nice once in a while, so that, that's great. Um, so to answer to your question, uh, I do speak from an Italian and European perspective. And uh, from our analysis, it seems that the energy crisis triggered by the Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused both movements, which are opposite to each other. On one side, accelerating efforts that were already being made towards energy transition, and on the other side, slowing down, even hindering these efforts towards that energy transition. On the, let's say, positive side, the acceleration of energy transition, we can see the response that was given by the European Union through the Repower EU, which is a plan uh, aimed at uh, accelerating the deployment of renewable energy in Europe, um, the uh, promotion of uh, uh, energy efficiency measures, and uh, savings uh, measures as well, and also the promotion of other sources, green sources of, <clears throat> of energy like biogas and hydrogen. Um, we can see that uh, repower, the data are showing that possible scenario, scenarios already by 2030 show that the implementation of all these measures by Repower U together with a Fit for 55 package will produce a reduction of 40% of the demand. Uh, and even the, uh, there is an, a more optimistic scenario by the International Energy Agency that says that if Europe will invest in clean energy development, then the reduction of gas demand will be 60%. So we can see that there is already a drop in the demand. In, the, in 2022, European demand dropped by around 10%, including in Italy. And this thanks to energy savings, uh, diversification, uh, renewable energy, and, uh, and so on. So uh, we can say that in this sense, energy, uh, the energy crisis has actually accelerated this movement towards transition. On the other side, though, uh, it also kind of like prompted a kind of like a frantic reaction towards the need to replace as soon as possible uh, Russian gas. Uh, and this has led to a new dash for gas from European member states. And actually, Italy was in the driving seats of such movement, uh, signing several contracts with many countries for new gas contracts, for new infrastructure, 
um, <clears throat> and uh, showing that there is there is this need of replacing um, replacing Russian gas with further gas. Uh, if we look at the data, then uh, we can actually say that if in the immediate aftermath of the uh, invasion, <clears throat> this kind of behavior, behavior could be explained today with the data that show that there is a decline of the demand and there will be even a more decline, this is actually not, uh, not relevant. So we need to be very um, careful of the choices, the policies choices that we are taking today. Sorry, maybe I took too long. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I think you touched on a very important uh, uh, question because maybe for Europe, it's clear the expectations and why, when, till when they need the gas, but maybe for the countries where Europe is going to and raising the expectations of like wanting their gas, it's not clear that this is maybe a short term issue and not like a long uh, term uh, issue. So there is a lot of work to be done there, uh, I'm sure. So uh, we move now to Latin America and see how Latin America sees this issue of uh, uh, the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, crisis and how what impact did it have on energy transition from Latin America, from where you're standing, Marutia, and the studies that you've done and the analysis that you've seen. Did it accelerate the energy transition or on the contrary, it slowed it down? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation for this panel. Uh, I would uh, speak from some countries like Colombia, because in Latin America also there are many differences. There are export big uh, like Venezuela, rich oil countries, and there are some that are importing their energy. Uh, regarding uh, uh, Colombia, it has benefited from the increase in the prices of oil and coal also, uh, two main sports of the country. And this had positive effects on the trade balance and on tax revenues. Um, in addition, export volumes grew uh, due to the increased demand. In, in uh, last year, for example, uh, Germany alone doubled its purchases of Colombian coal. So, um, and the state company Ecopetrol benefited from the rise in crude oil and diesel. Last year, it achieved its the best financial results in its history, as well as the highest dividend payout, uh, from which the Ministry of Finance received $5. billion. Uh, this amount almost doubled the one it received in 2021. So it's an important effect in the, a positive effect that helped um, set off, uh, uh, sorry, offset this higher energy cost, inflation, and increasing the exchange rate. At the end, the net balance has been very positive in financial terms for the country. Uh, how this affects energy transition? This situation has had negative incentives to advance in the transition, mainly because uh, there was an expectation of very high income for companies in the hydrocarbon sector. Uh, the increase in international demand for gas encouraged uh, gas exploration. More than half of Ecopetrol's exploration budget uh, last year was allocated to the search of these fuels. So um, at the same time, it reinforces the idea of the need to explore for hydro hydrocarbons to ensure self-sufficiency. Since importing oil or gas at high prices would be very detrimental for the country. Colombia has only um, proven reserves from oil and gas for just over seven years. So it's uh, a main discussion in the country. Uh, it, there's also a broad understanding that oil will generate the resources needed to fund the energy transition and that it would take um, years to replace the export and income generation capacity of the extractive sector. Uh, let's not forget that coal is a very important uh, resource for the, the export balance of Colombia. Um, so some sectors uh, see that what should be done is to continue exporting oil and carbon as long as there is in demand in countries that are accelerating their energy transition, as, Jul as Julia told us. Um, but in this regard, this is a special moment for Colombia because in August, uh, the, there was a new government and Gustavo Petro's government has uh, 
put in the agenda the energy transition. But at the same time, the, his government has extraordinary resources generated by the crisis. So uh, um, it's not clear if the government is going to be able to allocate them to advance the energy transition since it has many social commitments that imply fiscal requirements. It's now in this situation. So um, for the government, uh, it has uh, reduced subsidies, subsidies for imported gasoline, which is a good signal to um, discourage uh, the use of fossil fuels. But uh, it's a moment uh, interesting to see what happened. Maybe in the next uh, question, we can uh, go further in the transition proposed. Yes, th thank you. Thank you uh, all for this first round uh, of the questions and the uh, answers. Uh, so and always not easy when there is a sector that makes so much money and you are to think about the future of the sector and uh, what to do with it. Uh, so uh, not easy sometimes for policymakers. We should always remember, uh, uh, remember that they have to make tough, tough choices. But as long as people understand, I guess, why these choices are being made when they have ownership of the decisions, then they will go along. If they don't understand, they will resist, I guess. Uh, this is uh, a normal. So now we're going to have 15 minutes to talk about, about policies of the uh, countries regarding energy uh, transition. And then uh, we go again back to you, uh, Yaya Katrin, to ask you about Senegal. So for Senegal, uh, you touched a bit about like wanting to invest in gas and the role of gas. So what are the objectives and the challenges, basically? Because I guess this, these objectives are coming with challenges and opportunities for, uh, for the energy transition in Senegal. And specifically to talk about, the, 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 about what we came to talk here about the gas, the role of gas in this process. And the update today, it's like finally the jet P was announced for uh, Senegal. And what does that mean? Uh, for Senegal and for the energy transition with this 2.5 billion that is committed to Senegal to move on with their energy plan. So, Yaya Katrin, give us an overview of what's happening in Senegal. Okay, so thank you very much again for giving me the floor. Uh, as you all know, the African continent uh, continues to face the challenge of access to, to energy. Uh, according to the I IEA, uh, 2050 roadmap forecast, 90% uh, of the world's population without access to electricity in 2040 uh, will live in Africa. So this figure is, is alarming as we know that energy is a major uh, pillar for, for emissions. So in our countries, the prior objective uh, remains to guarantee universal access uh, for the population to quality energy in sufficient quantity and at a low cost to improve key sectors uh, such as health, food, and education. Uh, so Senegal has a, a, a universal access objective in 2025. So it is uh, important uh, to underline that we um, when there is a challenge of access uh, to, to, to energy, uh, we discovered oil and gas resources in Senegal, uh, about 910 billion uh, cubic meter. Uh, so the government uh, started in 2018, the implementation of a gas to power strategy uh, to use our local resources to increase the electricity uh, supply capacity. But uh, before talking about the gas to power strategy, uh, I should recall that in Senegal, uh, we have started making efforts uh, since 2012. Uh, the share of renewable energies has increased from 8% in 2012 uh, to 30% uh, today. So this is one of the largest uh, rates in, in Africa. And we made this uh, 
despite the major technical constraints uh, generated in our uh, electricity network and which we, we, we are continu continuing to deal with uh, today. But coming back to the gas to power strategy uh, that is being uh, implementing, the objective was to replace uh, electricity production from 70% uh, based on petroleum products and coal to approximately 70% uh, based on natural gas by 2025. So this fuel change uh, would reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, by around 60% in 2030 compared to our business as, as usual. Uh, so you, 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 today what we should understand is that our energy transition is based on natural gas to replace uh, heavy fuels, heavy oil fuels, and renewable energies that we have uh, actually at 30% of, uh, of, of, of our mix. Uh, the challenges we are facing uh, to, to do this energy, this energy transition is the actual international context. Uh, it is very difficult to, 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 to con uh, how, how can I? It is very difficult to defend uh, the fact that the paths uh, towards the energy transition must take into account the differences in economic and social development uh, to ensure in our countries peace, security, and stability. Uh, in Senegal, we are facing the difficulty to, to finance our gas projects. Uh, and this is part of our energy transition. So we need a, a fair and equitable energy transition uh, that permit us to, 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 uh, to, to use the natural resources to ensure our development, but this nat natural resources, uh, which is ga natural gas, will be also combined to, 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 to to renewable energies. So we need concrete actions uh, to facilitate access to financing uh, renewable energy, but also cleaner energy, such, such as natural gas, to manage a progressive phase out of uh, heavy fuel oils. And we also need an active cooperation for the development and transfer of new energy uh, te technologies. Uh, so you, you talked about the, 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 the JEPI, so which is the Just Energy Transition Partnership. Uh, yes, Senegal and the International Partners Group, IPG, uh, we were negotiating with France and Allemagne uh, precisely. Uh, so we agreed on a Just Energy Transition Partnership uh, on the 22nd of June, so it was uh, last week. Uh, this partnership, it will help us uh, to, ac to accelerate the deployment of renewable, of, of renewable energies that we already started, as I said earlier, since uh, 2012. Uh, but we will increase the share of renewable energies in, in, in installed capacity to 40%. So today we are to 30%. We will go to 40% within uh, 2030. Uh, and we will, so we will put 40% uh, of, of uh, renewable energies uh, in our mix by 2030. So to accelerate uh, this deployment of uh, renewable energies, uh, the international partners are, are going to mobilize 2.5 billion euros uh, over an initial period of three to five years. But it is important to underline that this 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 amount of money can increase uh, le, le, can can increase later. But uh, there is an initial amount of 2.5 billion euros that will be mobilized uh, starting from 2023. So the country see it as a great opportunity uh, to ensure universal access, because as I said earlier, our first objective is universal access to electricity for all the Senegalese people. So this JETP will allow us to go further on this universal access uh, process. 
but uh, as you can see in this in this uh, partnership it will also help us to to include training research technology transfer uh, the expansion and modernization of our electricity grid we must underline that the fact that we couldn't put more renewable energies in our grid uh, was technical uh, const con constraint, as you know about intermittency. So uh, modernizing our electricity grid will help us to, to, to put more renewable energy in the grid. And we will also develop, develop storage capacity um, and other projects in renewable energy. So this JetP, we see it as, a, as an opportunity to, to reach our universal access objective uh, by 2025, but also another opportunity uh, to exchange with other countries uh, to, to have their experience uh, to be trained so that we can man well manage our our the the, the 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 fact that we have uh, renewable energy in our grid and manage the intermittency and other key 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 factors that uh, other key issues that we are facing today. So that's what I wanted to to to, to say. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, definitely, and congratulations for that. And just uh, just I will do a follow up question, but you can answer it in the Q and A uh, uh, section. Uh, and I, remi I remind everyone that whoever wants to answer uh, to have uh, to to raise questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q and A box. So the question will be for you for later to answer. Do you think this jet P that came now will uh, will uh, slow down the gas projects? As you said, you are finding uh, difficulties in financing the gas projects, and it seems that your gas projects that will have an important place in the development. So do you think that now that there is the JetP commitment. It will it will be uh, it will take away from the financing of the gas projects. So I'll be waiting for your answer, and I think like everyone on this call is going to wait for that for the answer as well. So uh, Julia, uh, to go to Europe now. Uh, so uh, Italy is a European country, of course, committed to achieve international and EU, especially climate objectives and energy transition. Still, uh, we saw the Prime Minister of Italy alongside the CEO of ENI, that is one of the biggest uh, uh, energy companies, uh, touring the world to secure gas and new contracts and new projects to increase uh, gas production and to secure gas needs for the country. So how does Italy see the future of gas and is it indispensable for the energy uh, transition and with it, with it, will it align with countries in the Middle East that say that still oil and gas is important for energy transition and energy transition does not mean that we need to stop completely producing oil or gas. Thank you. Thank you for this question, which is very interesting. So this is what has been you know, said that gas is part of the transition, but in our position, we are in a, in a different space. So as you said, Italy is committed to very ambitious uh, international objectives, very ambitious European Union objectives. And Europe, Italy is also you know, a member of the G7 and uh, has committed also to, for example, by 2035, achieve a complete renewable energy power sector. So these are very important uh, ambitions that Italy committed to. So it is true that Italy has this strong commitment towards international objectives. On the other side, as you said, um, we saw uh, political choices made towards another direction. And uh, as I said before, um, this comes probably from an understanding of energy security in a way that is conceived as only security of supplies. So there was a strong need in the aftermath of the uh, energy crisis to replace Russian gas with other sources of, of gas and natural gas. Um, and this uh, conception of energy security does not include any element of climate security, of human secu security, which are today actually being taken into consideration, including from the International Energy Agency, uh, which is a wider definition uh, and we need to understand that 
climate security and energy security can go together or must go together in the future. Uh, so it is true that Italy had signed many agreements for new, com new, co new gas contracts, new infrastructures with many countries in, uh, in Africa, for example, in North Africa, in the Middle East. Um, what uh, is the issue here? The issue here is that we saw before, I, as I answered my question earlier, that the direction towards which Italy, but Europe is going, it's toward a reduction, a strong reduction of gas demand uh, in, the, in the near future, not even uh, so far away. By 2030, the, this, the, the estimation is by a 40% 40, a 40 reduction. Um, so if we commit to new contracts and to new infrastructure, especially, uh, we are obliged somehow to keep investing in and slowing down the energy transition. There is an also another factor that we should take into consideration is that in 2022, um, energy was, uh, Italy was highly exposed to the volatil volatility of prices of energy. And uh, this costed you know, to Italian families and to the government um, a lot. So try and really understand it, that energy security can be achieved um, derailing, uh, disentangling from fossil fuels uh, could also actually ensure wider energy security in the future by developing more renewable energy um, in Italy and also supporting projects uh, on, re on, the, on the development of renewable energy in those countries that Italy is active with. Um, there was uh, this ambition expressed several times by the, by the government of becoming a new uh, gas hub between Europe, because of its uh, geographical position in the center of the Mediterranean, no? so between Europe, Middle East, Africa, we do believe that the ambition of becoming an energy hub is actually legitimate, and Italy could play an important role as a green energy hub, uh, but not as a, as, a, as a gas hub, because it's really kind of uh, um, obliging uh, to uh, keep investing, uh, especially uh, public money in those sectors that could benefit from, invest, from investments such as renewable development. Um, Italy's gas demand has been, apart from this year and apart from uh, from the, the, the package, the, the feed uh, for 55 and Repower U has been going down since 20, uh, to, 2005. So it reached a peak and then it went down. So really, this is not the road uh, for us. Um, so again, energy security can be achieved away from fossil fuels, investing in renewable, and uh, we believe that there is a place for a country like Italy to, to play an important role in the uh, energy transition of the whole region. Yeah, uh, thank you. And again, like for you, a question to think of for in the Q&A section. It's uh, this hub issue because it's really interesting. We're hearing uh, today about a new World Bank uh, uh, loan to, to Tunisia to provide, uh, to help Tunisia uh, create energy, clean energy from a project, solar project, and then uh, uh, send this to, uh, through, you, uh, through Italy uh, to Europe for clean energy and for the use of clean energy. We see other projects that hydrogen pipeline, again, between Germany and Italy, uh, again, uh, using uh, or collaborating with the region, with, the, with North Africa, et cetera. So maybe you can say something about like this ambition and how fair is it uh, for countries in the, in the South to be producing clean energy, but sending it all to Europe. Uh, so that will be an, another question for you. So now I move on to Colombia and to Maruzia to ask you, you know, I've been around with NRGI for 12 years and my first trip abroad was to Peru actually. And it was always fascinating for me, like when I go to Latin America, everybody was talking life beyond oil and gas. And it was for me like, I come from the Middle East. What does it mean life beyond? I, this is in 2012, yes? 2012, like how can you have life without oil and gas? So it's interesting that countries in Latin America were thinking, uh, were thinking about, uh, about that. So today, yeah, so how do countries such as uh, Colombia, and you gave us a bit of question, but more uh, answers, but how countries like uh, Colombia view the role of cars, as we said, in, in the energy transition? And what are their policies 
uh, regarding the renewables. And this, this relationship between, let's say, gas and renewables, specifically in the Colombian, uh, uh, in the Colombian case. So, and based on your studies that you've done. So please, Maruzia, give us your views on that. Thank you for your question, Lori. Uh, well, let me say before that the energy transition is a centerpiece of Gustavo's Petro's government. Uh, he started the government on August 2022. Uh, his administration considered that uh, the transition needs to be addressed with a sense of urgency, but in a progressive way. So that means that hydrocarbons hydrocarbons will maintain a significant role and the resources they generate must finance the energy transition. Um, there is no defined policy yet, but there is a methodology for establishing the roadmap for this transition. And this uh, document outlines uh, already some strategies. Uh, what do they say regarding the renewables? Um, it's, uh, they, they think that to, transport, to transform the energy matrix, it is necessary to incorporate renewable and or clean energy in addition to use the energy efficiently. Colombia has significant potential for non-conventional renewable sources in various parts of the territory. The government is committed to develop infrastructure and advanced technologies to accelerate its use to generate electricity. In the uh, development plan they approved for 2022 to 2026, uh, they established a goal to reach 2.3 gigawatts of new electricity generation, uh, 2.3 gigawatts of new electricity generation capacity with non-conventional sources. This means almost eight times the current capacity. Uh, with this type of energy. So it's a very challenging commitment for four years. Uh, besides, the, uh, they plan to uh, promote energy communities uh, so that rural, urban, and peri-urban communities can associate and generate their own energy with renewable sources and obtain profits from the sales of surpluses in four years. Uh, in, in, in the four years, they expect to have 20,000 new associated users in uh, these energy communities. Besides, um, because they call this is a just uh, trans uh, energy transition, not only at energy transition, they have many uh, commitments and pledge for the territories and the ethnic communities. So uh, since solar uh, and wind energy projects can have sociocultural and environmental impacts on the territories of these communities, the roadmap will foresee the design of institutional schemes that compensate them uh, fairly and let them also obtain benefits from this time, this type of new projects. Um, Along with these developments, uh, they state that uh, natural gas should play an, two important roles. One of it uh, is uh, to give stability and support to the growth of electricity generation with non-conventional sources of energy. Uh, and the other is to support the closing of energy gaps. It is planned to expand the natural gas service in low-income in urban households and rural uh, and rural ones that have conditions to use this type of energy. After four years, they should be 1.1 million new residential users of um, gas service. This will increase up to 12.8 million homes with natural gas service, which by the way means that 75% of Colombian population will have access to gas in their homes. Uh, and that's, it's a big, uh, um, challenge also to substitute, substitute the gas. Um, so these guidelines define a substantial role for gas in the transition in a medium and long-term horizon, although they do not mention it as a transition fuel. Um, the importance of gas consumption in Colombia somehow, somehow explain that the government proposes not to work new oil and gas exploration contracts um, from now on, but it 
is interested in exploiting the offshore gas discoveries recently made by Ecopetrol and its partners as part of existing uh, contracts. So there's a debate in, in Colombia of, uh, if this is the right way to go. Um, because uh, even with contracts already set, explode, uh, exploding new uh, um, fields will uh, mean to uh, build new infrastructure that we have a, a life horizon of 30 years, maybe. So it will be difficult to avoid the carbon lock-in. Um, so the government um, recognizes that the natural ha gas has um, a lower environmental impact, but has also this uh, methane effect that it's a uh, more powerful greenhouse effect. So he is saying, yeah, we have to use it, but we have to plan also to substitute it in the short term. So I love, I love to be invited to Colombia and hear all these debates that are happening. I like the, the how the government is thinking, how approaching these things. It's like uh, a tricky, a tricky way. So I see that. Uh, there is like, if we want to close this, this chapter and move on to more about like people-centered uh, energy transition and ask like how people are feeling about all of this. So I guess like there is kind of consensus that countries like it or don't like it explicitly or implicitly, they are like still like needing gas and taking like my gas is kind of cleaner than the rest. So why shouldn't we use it because for whatever reason it is. So. Uh, tricky, uh, tricky business. Anyway, so again, like I see like already nine questions. So I think like we have a lot of questions to answer later. So that's why I'll go to, directly to the third part of our uh, 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 today discussion, which is about people centered. As uh, Maruzia said that there are controversial issues, people want to be involved, debate, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I go to you directly to, uh, to ask you like, the Senegal is, uh, we want a new producer, right? We call it like under new producer. And because I come from Lebanon, which for years wanted to become a new producer and I understand the expectations and the hype and the excitement. So my question for you is like, Senegal is an emerging producer, of course. How are citizens perceiving the new sector in the country? And what's the government doing to ensure there is awareness regarding the future of energy in the country and how expectations are managed. In Lebanon, they think that if they find one TCF of gas, it will change the whole world and we will become the more, again, the Monaco of the, of, uh, of, the, uh, the, of the East. So that's how we are obsessed about it. So yeah, Catherine, tell me what's happening in Senegal. Do you have the same hype? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this, for this question. I think that in Senegal, we are like Lebanon. <laughs> We also think that, uh, I will say we, because it's a general thinking that uh, when you discover oil and gas, it means that people will become rich in the country. Uh, we will no longer pay for uh, things like electricity or, or, um, or gas or something like that. Um, so the Senegalese uh, citizens are seeing this new sector uh, as a very great opportunity uh, to develop the country and to ameliorate the, the quality of life. As you know, in Senegal, um, we don't have yet 100% uh, access to electricity. Um, several several uh, parts of the country are not well developed. So this opportunity is very well uh, welcomed by the by the by, by by the population, but they are aware that if the, these resources are not well managed, uh, it can be a threat to our stability. Because unfortunately, we saw that in some uh, neighbor countries, uh, the starting of uh, oil and gas uh, production um, went with uh, some stability issues, some political issues. So in Senegal, people see it as a good opportunity, but we should stay uh, conscious that uh, this kind of resources uh, should be well managed uh, so that they don't bring uh, they, 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 they allow the country to, to stay stable. 
to, to answer the question about public awareness, uh, the government uh, developed several video extracts uh, showed on TV, uh, named uh, in French, Comprendre le pétrole et le gaz, uh, which means uh, understand the oil and gas sector. And the government de developed it to inform the population about all the, aspect, the, uh, the aspects going from the, the upstream of the, of the, of the, of, of the project. Uh, in addition, uh, several key representatives of the Ministry of Oil and Energy interviewed on radio shows to explain uh, in ordinary language the, the key aspects of oil and gas and how we are going to develop these projects in the country. So there were several um, tools used by the government to inform the population uh, about this uh, this 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 project. We can also name the several uh, public information uh, made by the, the president uh, to also inform the, 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 the population. Uh, also, the government uh, started an important reform of the legal and regulatory framework, uh, such as the, re the revision of the petroleum code and the new gas code that we voted. Um, and to ensure that Senegal, uh, Senegalese people are taking the most advantage of this sector. Uh, we developed uh, two main laws, which are the, the, local, the local content law. Uh, so the local content law is optimizing the, the, the way that the Senegalese people are um, associated to, to these projects. Uh, we also voted a law on the distribution of income from the exploitation of petroleum uh, resources. Uh, this law also takes into account uh, future generations. Uh, there is a fund for future generations coming from the, the oil and gas sector uh, revenue. Uh, and the president, Macky Sall, uh, on every occasion that he had uh, said that his priority attachment to the sustainable preservation, uh, as well as to the optimal and transparent expo exploitation of our natural resources. But uh, Senegal is taking into account all the, 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 the experience, the, the world experience that we can have in this field, the oil and gas sector, so that we are not going to make the same mistakes and that we are going to use the good uh, the good, uh, how, how can I say it, the good practices uh, the other countries uh, has. Thank you very much uh, again for this question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all of that. You reminded me of my days in Beirut when I used to be, uh, to, when I used to talk to the media and like ask people to manage expectations, etc. And and uh, government used to hate me. And then the first exploration happened and it was a dry well. And like, uh, I was like, didn't I tell you? Like, anyway, so, but uh, I think like people like uh, good news all the time and you don't want to be the bearer of, ba of bad news. But as you said, the key word, I guess, it's governance and good governance of the sector to be able really uh, to see the benefits uh, uh, of that. So, uh, Julia, I go to Europe. Uh, so I've been in Europe for six months now, like every day people talk about this issue of energy transition. I feel like people are more aware than other places and the expectations are different and there is more acceptability on energy transition issues uh, and moving to cleaner energy, et cetera. Maybe it's my perception, six months only, it doesn't say a lot, but what's happening in Italy, uh, as you explain the whole context about like, yes, rushing for the short-term security energy, but at the same time being committed to, eco uh, to, to the longer-term uh, targets, uh, how do people in Italy perceive uh, the gas issue and how do they perceive ENI? So basically, ENI is gas. So thank you. Um, so as you said, probably uh, in in, Euro, in Italy, as in the rest of the European country, there is more awareness of such issues. Although compared to other Western European countries, Italy got to this awareness a little bit later. We have to to. It's the Mediterranean touch. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So we're, we take our time, 
but we conducted uh, just last year one study, one survey together with an international group, more in common, to really take the polls of Italians regarding issues of climate and energy transition. But there are many available surveys um, doing the same uh, in Italy and other European countries. And uh, they all confirm more or less the same tre trend. There is actually a, a good understanding of energy transition issues and the need to take all uh, necessary measures to uh, align with climate objectives in Italy. So this is something that we can consider pretty solid. Um, a, we, we can also say that uh, there is, uh, there is the, the view of energy transition as an opportunity for economic, economic development. So one of the questions that we asked in the survey, for example, was how uh, they, 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 could real, they could conceive uh, um, the uh, deployment of renewable energy in Italy, and it was seen as a must for economic growth. So this is, there is a strong connection between, uh, between energy transition, economic growth, and I would say also just the transition. Someone else was mentioning it before, because really transitioning uh, from an economy based on fossil fuels towards a, an, an economy which is based on renewable energies uh, will take some adjustment that needs to be done in an orderly fashion and in a just way in order to you know, uh, maintain, an, uh, maintain a, 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 an employment uh, of people. Uh, but it seems that Italian do see energy transition as an opportunity for uh, more uh, job creation or economic growth and, and so on. Um, they are a little bit cautious about gas. So they do answer, there was a question about if Italy should stop using gas. And the answer was actually around 57% would say, yes, Italy should, you should stop using gas. Um, but then when we would ask the way uh, many, you know, uh, underlined how uh, this uh, this interruption should be progressive and not uh, immediate. So there is some uh, there is a, there are some somehow cautious about this this issue um, regarding ENI. So ENI, for those who don't know, is the National Italian uh, Oil and Gas Company, uh, which uh, now is a multinational company. So despite being a multinational profit private company, uh, although Italy still holds thirty percent of its share. Uh, it's seen as a national champion. So it's very much trusted by the political leadership, by the general public. Uh, although recently we started seeing with more awareness on climate, um, some attempts of civil society to question the, uh, in the aims of, of ENI on their carbonization, to question, for example, if their decarbonization strategy is actually aligned with our international commitments or not. And very recently there was, for example, the first legal action in Italy to be undertaken uh, on, on any. Uh, so we, we can see there is some, uh, some, uh, um, some concerns being raised by, by the general public, by the civil society. Um, as a matter of fact, if we look at what any has been doing in the, in the, in the last uh, in the last year, so especially, um, we can actually question whether their policies, their choices of today are aligned or not to uh, decarbonization uh, objectives. Um, for example, it's a, just a, a news from last week that any is uh, intends to uh, acquire a new uh, energy and oil and gas uh, oil and gas company, uh, spending around four point nine million in this which is roughly 34% of those extra profits generated in 2022 by the crisis. So by families that paid the extra cost of, of gas um, last year. Uh, and we believe that you know, for an effective transition, those uh, profits could you know, be, for example, uh, devoted to energy transition, so, so to, uh, to, to other efforts and not anymore in oil and gas. Uh, but as I said, uh, we are getting, we, we are starting this conversation and, and uh, um, there is some level of understanding right now in Italy. 
these issues. Thank you, thank you, Julia, for that. And I guess like it's part of the discussion that the uh, oil companies are saying that if we want to invest in renewable, and if we are like mandated to invest in new in renewables, we need money, and the money comes from oil and gas. This is where the a lot of money is coming, so that we are able to expand our portfolio. So uh, that's. Uh, that's uh, questionable maybe, or that is open to debate about how to take this. But I guess like from all your interventions, I'm understanding that there is the urgency, but at the same time, there is a need to progress or what BP had called it, the orderly transition. Uh, I understand that uh, this is what the countries uh, are saying. But again, like because we're focused on people centered here to Colombia, to go to Colombia, because Marutia, I really like what's happening in Colombia. So tell me all these debates about like open ended questions about the future of gas, the future of even the coal, the future of renewables. So where is all this discussion happening or like what are the spaces that are created to be inclusive debates and discussions where people have a say in this? So can you tell us a bit about these spaces that are being created or are created or the intent to be created in, in Colombia? Thank you. Well, in Colombia, there are well-supported civil society proposals on the need to accelerate the energy transition and on the role that gas could play. But such precisely proposals uh, is not a debate that reaches broad social, social sectors uh, who do not have these uh, issues as part of their agenda. But uh, it is important to point out that there are other movements that uh, that were created. For example, uh, the anti-fracting movement that was established in Colombia some years ago, and it's uh, still active, against the exploitation of non-conventional fields that was about to start with two pilot projects. The local rejection was massive and gave rise to the confluence of environmental, union, academic, territorial, defense, organi defense organizations that carried out uh, many initiatives to stop and ban these, um, these pilots uh, and the, also the exploitation of these fields. They disseminated the social and environmental risk of this technique um, and of deepening also the oil dependence. They carried out protests, uh, resistant actions in defense of water, territory, and uh, health. And they turned also to the, even to the courts to request the protection of the rights of the afro wilches population that were not consulted about the uh, start, the beginning of these pilots in their territory. So in 2022 uh, came this government of Gustavo Petro and it engaged since all already since a com political campaign, but oh yeah, already in the government, it engaged with these demands and introduced a new bill uh, to ban this type of oil and gas development and the fracking technique. Uh, the bill has already been approved by the Senate and it's in, already in the House of Representatives. So there's, there's such a movement you know, so technical when we speak about uh, gas and transition, but just when it uh, are when the territories and the natural resources are in danger. <coughs> uh, but now there uh, there is a very interesting process because the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Energy is carrying out is carrying on a broad participatory process to design this the roadmap for the just energy energy transition. It seeks the particip participation of all interest groups and will include mechanisms to incorporate opinions of the society in general and it would pay special attention to the diversity of cultural, ethnic, and gender perspective in all the territories, because you know, Colombia is a very diverse uh, country. And the roadmap, the roadmap should respond to the different characteristics of these regions. It is a binding dialogue. It means that, um, the, that the government uh, must integrate the agreements that are reached in this uh, dialogue. Um, it's also um, it, but um, we who are participating is the national government, the territorial communities, the business and production sector, the civil society organization, um, 
And this, this dialogue was to last six months. Uh, uh, and the results were supposed to be ready in, at the beginning of May. However, uh, the minister announced that this process should take 15 months and that the roadmap would be ready by the end of February 2024. Um, and now I think the involvement of social in organizations in Colombia is very important because it is opportunity to present proposals to the national and territorial discussion that is taking place and pursue its inclusion in the final document. The key is to have viable proposals to the short, for the short term because the government will have the roadmap ready for the second half of its administration. So long-term guidelines are important, but the key is what can be implemented in those two years uh, in relation to renewable energy and natural gas that laid solid uh, foundations to continue the process. Definitely, thank you for this, because I guess even if it's long, a long process, but I think like this is the foundation for any acceptability and for any success of any project, because it's from the start, people are not, kind of involved in the strategy or in the implementation or the design of this uh, tr uh, transition. So there will be resistance and therefore like there will be failures. So even if it takes 15 months, I guess it makes sense as long as it is inclusive and uh, uh, the cons uh, consultations and the recommendations are taken uh, on board. So uh, good luck. Uh, invite me, uh, invite me to Colombia, uh, and definitely invite me to Italy as well, Julia. Invite me to Senegal. I'll go uh, anyway. So now it's uh, we'll go to the questions. Uh, we have 13 questions, which is great. Which means like you really raised people's uh, excitement and interest to ask you questions. So uh, let me uh, go through questions and see who would want uh, uh, to answer these questions. So the first question that I have, it says, uh, my question to President Macky Sall this morning is relevant here for the panelists from Senegal about the green energy deal Senegal has signed with G7 uh, nations and EU. Uh, uh, and it stops here. I don't see, most probably it's about the JetP, I guess. So, uh, uh, ah, yeah, so it continues. What are the terms of this agreement? Who was involved? Which government body will manage these funds? How will they, they be spent? What are the implications for Senegal? So, uh, yeah, yeah, Catherine, so then I will go to my questions. You can answer this and my question was, it, will this JetB agreement uh, slow down or uh, kind of, be less uh, for for institutions, financial institutions, to be less enthusiastic about investing in the gas projects that Senegal is so keen on uh, on having. So, what's your views on that? Is it is it a good news for gas, or it's not a good news for gas? So, th thank you, thank you for this question. Uh, in my point of view, it's not a bad news for gas, uh, since it is a just energy transition partnership. Uh, it is uh, focalized on renewable energy. So it is a financing for renewable energy. Uh, as I said, uh, Senegal wants uh, within, uh, by 2030, to have 40% of renewable energy in the mix and the 70 other percent will be uh, majorly gas. So Senegal will continue to look for, for the financing of gas projects. But for the renewable energy projects, uh, it is a good uh, new that uh, a good new news that uh, we have this JP that will help us to to finance renewable because Senegal needed to finance renewable energy since we wanted to maintain the thirty percent that we had in our mix. We we had to finance renewable energy, so this JP is the way for financing renewable energy. But in my point of view, I don't think it's a slowdown for, 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 for gas. Uh, it depends on which point of view, because today the, the, the G7 countries that we were talking to, you have some countries that don't want to finance gas uh, uh, now. So they will finance renewable energy. But I think that there is other ways to finance gas projects and Senegal will look for, for, for those ways. 
So another question for you, There's, there are a lot, many questions on the JetP. I guess people are excited about this news. So uh, one uh, from uh, Razan Bailey that says that South Africa received JetP uh, funding, which was largely loans with condition conditionalities, such as moving from coal uh, to uh, renewables. What are the conditions, uh, condition conditionalities uh, attached to the Senegal deal? And again, the other question is related to that. Uh, can you specify if it is, it's a grant or loan to Senegal and mm -hmm. how will this jet fee impact Senegal LNG uh, export plans? And let me see, because there is another question uh, and that uh, other question as well, so you can answer them all. What's the status of your plan to convert coal and oil fired plants to gas production in Senegal? Would you please expound about the hydropower project in partnership with OMSV and OMVG. And so I guess these are the questions on Senegal. And then we move on to others later. So I, go ahead. I, I will not forget the question, but talking about the terms of the, of the agreement, the terms of the agreement are very uh, simple. Senegal want to use gas uh, for energy transition. But uh, by 2030, we will have 40% of renewable energy and gas will replace the heavy fuel oil uh, power plants that we have actually. So the terms of the agreements are the 40% of renewable energy. We agreed with the G7 countries that by 2030, we will have 40% of renewable energy in our mix. So this agreement is only about renewable energy. Uh, there is no uh, other agreement, but we, we, there is um, some, how, how can I say it? Senegal will further uh, go on energy transition, but all these things are related by the, on the 40% of renewable energy in the mix. And uh, on the other side, the, the IPG countries will allow the money to, to, to to reach this, uh, this, this objective. Um, I think the other question was about... Um, if it's a loan or a grant, and the LNG yeah, project. Loan, loan, loan. In, in, in this financing, we have several parts. We have loans, we have grants, uh, concessional uh, loans. So it's not only loan or grants, but we have a percentage of... Uh, which uh, each country uh, said I will give loan or grant, but it's not, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's so it's, uh, it's diverse, it's a diverse pool, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a diverse it's, conditions. Yeah, yeah, so basically for, for people to understand and correct me if I got it right. So this jet B, it's not the same like South Africa where the main condition was to shift from using coal to, for electricity to moving into renewables. So this is like, just like for you to continue uh, investing in renewables to reach to 40% now that you are at 30%. So it's a 2.5 billion to increase that 10% of injection. It has nothing to do with switching to other places because will it automatically mean that when you're adding 10% renewables, is it going to switch from the, your use of fossil fuel for, for electricity or it will be on top of that. So these will be for new projects and not to, to switch or are we going into details that are not clear now? No, just when, when, when you say that actually you have 30% of renewable and you increase by 10, it means that you will decrease uh, the other sources of, of, of energy. But yeah, this, this, this agreement is only on renewable. But in Senegal, we, we made the choice to replace heavy fuel oils by gas. So it is part of our NDC, and it's uh, it's our our own. Um, okay. It's our, yeah. Great. So uh, so I guess like now and the meetings that happened in Paris, everybody was talking about the financial mechanisms and the new financial system that needs to be set in place. And everyone in Paris was criticizing the World Bank, the IMF, and the, and uh, all these financing mechanisms, saying that. For climate financing, we need new mechanisms, and so I guess like it's a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal for uh, for financing. And now, yeah, Katrin, you're saying that 
guys, we need money to invest in gas. This is your this is your pitch, if you want, right? So keep it for the end when I give you the last word. And uh, my my other question is, I guess for Julia, I'm, I'm uh, because it doesn't say who, but like it says the EU knows that their gas demand will decrease, but do you know whether they disclose this in their discussions and deals with producing countries? It risks spending billions on infrastructure that will take decades to complete, by which point demand will decline. Any, any views on that, uh, Julia? Yes, so I mean, the direction towards which Europe is going uh, is clear. It's going towards energy transition, the reduction of all fossil fuels in their economies. And this has been established in all objectives and all measures, policies, recommendations, uh, directive, uh, regulations, and so on. So this is pretty clear. It's solid. Um, it was probably disclosed. The, the issue here, and this is also what we are saying, is that we really need to be careful with the decisions that we're taking today because we risk to you know, generate stranded assets for both those economies who are investing and those economies who are also you know, building and uh, building plans of de development on top of this uh, new gas sales and infrastructures. So um, this is really risky and we really need to look at the convenience, not just of today, but also of tomorrow. Uh, somehow, according to different countries, of course, um, let's say that the, the hope would be that, for example, when building new gas infrastructure, this could be hydrogen ready. So that one day could be used for uh, transferring uh, hydrogen produced in one country to another. Although, I have to say today, we do not have the technology available uh, for doing that. At the, at the current state, technology can only blend maximum 20% of uh, hydrogen into natural gas uh, because the composition is completely different. So the issues of transporting hydrogen is very complicated, complicated and complex. So saying that uh, in 10 years, 15 years, that same infrastructure could transport uh, hydrogen is, is a stretch. So, our analysis says that it's, it's better to actually maximize existing, already existing infrastructure. Um, so for example, when, uh, when, when we look at countries that are um, selling natural gas, for example, to Italy, we can uh, invest money in the development of renewable energy in the country so that they can sell now that the, the price is, is pretty good, uh, at maximum capacity, their gas to uh, to Europe and uh, when it's still needed, without building new infrastructure, can really could risk to be uh, a stranded asset. Um, and for this, it it needs strong, for example, public guarantees from European countries. And so it's it's really a cycle, um, a vicious cycle that we think uh, it's better to avoid in this sense. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, there, there is another question directly on Italy that says, could you please extend on how Italy is addressing the potential impacts of the energy transition on traditional energy sectors and their uh, workforce? And thank you. So there are many instruments to look at energy transition in, in Italy, especially like given by uh, the instruments developed by the European climate governance. And here really the need so it's also what we do as ECHO is to push for a holistic approach to, to energy transition in order to really take into consideration all the dimensions that are invested, which is not necessarily just a, a power sector issue. It uh, invests the industry, uh, employment, uh, social issues, uh, fiscal responsibility issues, and so on. So really what needs to be done is an effort to go beyond silos uh, policy making and integrate uh, this consideration and mainstream them uh, along all the different uh, decision making processes that are taking uh, place. So this is really what we, we try to do 
uh, with public participation. I think uh, this was also something that Marisa was mentioning before about Colombia. So we incentivize public participation, access, uh, to, to these processes from, uh, from civil society, scientific community, and so on, to contribute, to, to really uh, identify the targets and the hows. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And now I want to go to Marussia. Uh, look, there is a question about, because you were talking about like all these spaces for debate and inclusive uh, debate. So there is a question uh, that says, what do you think is the role of lobby and vested interest in debate about the role of gas in the different countries uh, we are discussing here. So, but I just want to know your views on uh, uh, Colombia, because like if it's open and inclusive debate, uh, this, it means that there are vested interests as well that they want to push in one direction to the another. So what's your views uh, on that? And at the same time, uh, for our panelists, you can go and check if there are questions that were uh, that were uh, assigned to you or like in, uh, for you for the countries you cover and if you can answer uh, them that would be great as well uh, because I want to hear Marutia and then like we we have like less than five minutes because I don't want to go over uh, a time I'm sure like you are all busy and thank you for being with us all this time so Marutia what do you think how to uh, protect these discussions from uh, uh, invested interests? Or it's or is it it's a natural natural part of discussions. Thank you for the question. I think it's natural part of the of the situation because in Colombia there is a very power uh, full of powerful of organizations but from the private sector because they as I told before gas is a very uh, is very. Um, big in the country, millions of family uses gas and also um, industry. It is not used uh, to generate electricity as a, as a basis because it's, it's water, the main source of energy, but it also contributes when there is drought, like from El Nino, for example. Um, so gas is, uh, and they have uh, some um, unions, these private unions for enterprises, companies that are lobbying be, um, very steady about the, that gas is the fuel for the transition. It's clean, it, uh, it's the, this carbon dioxide too is very, very low. Uh, they avoid the problem of methane. Uh, so um, it's going, but it's already there. Uh, it's for years. Uh, since uh, Latin America and the world is talking about uh, trans energy transition, they are they are lobbying and they are publishing and they are debating about the role of gas. So I think they are going to continue doing that. And but it's but what is very important now is that the government is opening this this uh, dialogue and that this goes very deep in the territories. Uh, they as they did. Some, somehow the same uh, process for the development plan, uh, many discussions uh, along the regions, and now they are in this process. So uh, what I think uh, is that uh, these so civil society organizations must take, must take the lead, must their proposal, it's the time to put the proposals uh, on, on the table. And, uh, because the government is giving special attention, special opportunity for these uh, ethnic communities, is uh, discussing about gender um, specific, uh, how it affects women, this transition, and also the, the oil industry. So I think um, we as civil society organizations have a, a role, although in Peru, but uh, it's a very important, um, interesting time for organizations in Colombia. Marutia, thank you. We still have two minutes. I will consider that this is your recommendation and final pitch for civil society uh, to, to be more assertive and have plan and pursue it. And then I'll ask Julia for a last pitch or last recommendation. And then we'll go to Yai Katrin before uh, we end uh, this panel and I'm so proud that we have had people from the start to the beginning and no one dropped out of this session. Uh, it's, it's because of you, so uh, congratulations. 
uh, for you three. So, uh, Julia, final recommendations. I think I can join Marussia's recommendation on a more active civil society, which uh, is uh, more aware and uh, pushes for the right directions. Uh, just one very small thing about the question that you asked me before about how to avoid that, you know, renewable development in some parts of the world become a new source of colonial uh, relationship. And uh, the, the very different things of electricity and the development of renewable energy is that it's a completely different system. It can be decentralized. There are no relations of dominance between one and the other. It's a, it's a relation of interdependence. So for example, if we imagine an, an integrated grid in the Mediterranean, uh, where each country produces and share uh, and takes when uh, it's not producing and gives uh, when it's producing, that is a very different way of thinking energy security. So my recommendation is also to think at, outside of the box and look at other innovative solutions that can you know, uh, bring us somewhere else music to my ears any project on integration i am in so invite me julia on that Absolutely. i believe that the Medi mediterranean integra integration and collaboration is crucial to advance the energy transition agenda yay katrin senegal celebrating the jet P. hopefully it will be a good thing so what's your last uh, last uh, recommendation or last thoughts before we end yeah, so my 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 last uh, my last word will uh, will just continue in the same road as Jordana. We we should just underline that in Senegal, we have signed a jet peak, but Senegal also started to do what we call here the PIMC, which is a, a, a an integrated plan to produce electricity at a lower cost. So we we will. Uh, look at costs uh, in electricity before we, we 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 develop every 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 project. So yes, we are doing the energy transition, but the first objective is universal access at the lower costs. And uh, if I if I have um, ten, maybe a, ten seconds, uh, you have. Yeah, a recommendation yeah. is that we should look at all the possibilities in producing electricity. Look at climate also impacts, but uh, we should stay open that um, electricity can be produced by several uh, possibilities, uh, taking it into account the climate uh, impact. Thank you. So thank you uh, for our panelists. Thank you, Yaya Katrin Diop from Senegal. Thank you, Julia Giordano from Italy. And thank you, Maruzia uh, ruiz Car Caro from uh, uh, Peru, from Latin America. I know it was too early for you, so it's still maybe dark. I'm not sure. So thank you. And I'm so happy and proud to be hosting this all women uh, uh, panel. It was great. So thank you for all. And thank you for all that were uh, here from the beginning till the end. And thank you for NRGI and Faru Mateo. And thank you for uh, ETH for organizing this. And thank you and goodbye. <laughs>